I'd always wanted a tattoo, um, but I didn't want any old thing like a rose or a heart, so when they did the Pacifier album, I really liked the artwork on the CD cover. So armed with that, I went along to the tattoo parlor and the guy did it. But then they uh, changed their name and I just had them add the word Pacifier as well. We've got to own the decisions we made. I don't blame anybody apart from ourselves. I don't hate anyone for what happened. I feel more disappointment in myself for letting myself get talked into things that I should have known better. There are good things that happen to you that don't necessarily make good things happen in the future, and there are bad things that happen to you that don't necessarily mean that bad things are going to happen in the future. Sometimes the bad things create great things for you and sometimes the good things create nightmares. They're almost stories, you know, it's like listening to a musical story. And as a kid, I think that's how I related to them, you know, like stories with sound, you know, stories with melody, you know, and melody makes it's emotive, you know, so therefore it conjures up feelings and emotions, you know. Oh, yeah. That's a good song.
He was just one of those kids that commanded attention, but in a nice way. He was like chatterbox, you know, he could really talk himself, himself out of a paper bag. You know, he really could. He didn't really do a lot of school no, learning. No. He'd rather entertain the class. Yes, yeah. And the teacher said... Uh, oh, he's, he's an exhibitionist. Yeah. We went for a trip to UK, and when he was eight... Yeah, and Yvonne's brother, uh, Charlie, he used to play a guitar, and John was fascinated with this guitar. I'd never sat in a room with an acoustic guitar being played before, and I was blown away. It was like, how did he do that? You know, like, it was like a magic trick, you know? And I wanted to know what the secret behind that magic was, you know? Because I wanted to do it. I just knew straight away. My name is Tom Larkin. I'm 93 years old. I have various claims to eminence, but one of the particular ones that some people uh, enjoy is that I'm the father of Tom Larkin, the drummer of Shehard. I was ambassador for New Zealand and Japan, and most people think I did a pretty good job there. This is a very early photo of, of Tom, just a, a few months before we left for Japan. He was very happy and then suddenly he became unhappy, particularly when he first came back because he had a soft American accent that he picked up at this Japanese school. I was a fat kid, so I was bullied really heavily in primary school. Because I was being bullied, I got moved from a couple of schools to another couple of schools, and it was always a, a, a source of shame for my mother. In some ways, in my family, excellence was seen as normality. It wasn't like it was an option. And that gave me, you know, some, some great skills, but it also tortured me at the same time because I was a fat kid the whole time, right? So that wasn't excellent. I think for anyone who feels somewhat alienated, music that conveys anger gives you a release valve, and playing drums helped offset a lot of my anger. I met Tom at school, and he was the metal guy. For some reason, I liked that shit. And we started hanging out. We stood out. Oh, we were in the same art class as well. And I was sort of fascinated by this guy who had written Van Halen and Iron Maiden and all this crap over his bag. So it was my first experience with one of the, the metal guys. When he found out that I had learned guitar, went, fuck, you should play electric guitar in my band. I play drums, man. I was like, really? OK, cool. I was a huge music fan. I was really heavily into ACDC and Iron Maiden. When I saw John, I saw someone who could potentially be a partner in crime. I'd learned how to go, you know, you know. I'd never used a pick, so I was like, wow. OK, so how do you do this shit? And he was like, deaden the strings, mate, deaden the strings. Whoa! <laughs> I can believe it. It was that easy, really? So that, that develops into it. And then Metallica came along, and that was the one band that John and I really connected on. And none of our peers liked it. The sound was just as big as I made them. It sounded like a, the sound of a, what you'd imagine a machine. But they're just these guys, you know, like leather jackets and T-shirts and jeans and stuff and basketball boots, sort of like what we were wearing, you know? And it was like, if he can do it, I can do it, you know? We found Phil, probably within six months of us starting to really follow that path, there was a notice board and there was this really bad writing lead guitarist plays heavy metal looking for band and the phone conversation that followed that was amazing and you know it, it, to this day you know that kind of golf in relating to each other the two different worlds of the world of phil versus our world colliding for the first time was um it's something that's never really gone away <laughs> you've got to do a cartoon of our first conversation with you yeah, really. You should actually do that, because it was amazing. Yeah. How did it go? Well, yeah, yeah, OK, OK. So Tom and, Tom and yeah. I are sitting up at, 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 in Tom's bedroom. Yeah. Hi there, I'm wondering if Phil is there? Uh, Phil? OK, hold it one second. Philip! Give me the... Yeah, Hi, is that Phil? Yeah. I'm ringing about the uh, guitar ad. Yeah. Uh, OK, well, we've got a band, and, uh, yeah, we've actually got another guitarist in the band. I'm just wondering if you can handle playing with that. Yeah, but how good is he? Oh, he's, he's, he's really good. He's a rhythm guitarist, so, you know, if you want to play lead, he's able to, you know. OK, well, can he play something down the phone so I can see how serious you guys are? So, uh, yeah, there you go. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
you think? Oh, yeah, that is pretty good. Yeah, come and pick me up in your parents' silver Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> We crashed the shit out of that car. We've got a lot of gear into it. It's all bogans and a drum. Phil came in and I couldn't, I found it really hard to communicate with him. And I think he found it really hard to communicate with us. I think he found it pretty hard to communicate with a lot of people, really. He's so withdrawn, so, so introverted and nervous. But yes, as soon as he played guitar, it was like, wow, man, this guy is insanely good. So this is Phil, who's very, very fair, very blonde, quite sensitive, listening to music. When I was 11, I yeah, asked my mum to take me to guitar lessons, and that's where, that's where that started. And, um, I mean, I just became completely obsessed, you know? I'd skip, wag, school, and just stay at home and just sit in front of the heater, you know, because it was cold at the time, and just, um, just practice my guitar shredding, you know, like, practice these scales and licks and stuff. It was mostly the guitar soloing, you know, at that stage. I wanted to be a guitar soloist. Metal is mostly a white middle class male thing, isn't it? You know? For the most part, we haven't struggled as kids, you know, in the cotton fields. Uh, for the most part, we've all had a pretty sheltered uh, upbringing. It was she had a Wellington speed metal band with a track called It. And if you like the sound of that, I suggest you get down to Sammy's tonight and see them live. However, in the studio now, I have John Toogood, who's in the band. How's it going? So what does the name She Had mean? Um, it's actually She Had. She Had. <laughs> this is the story about how we got our name She Had. Me and Tom Larkin were watching the movie Dune and the name for the battle at the end was the Jihad, which we had no idea was Jihad. And um, just thought, wicked, that's wicked. <laughs> that's a great name for a bombastic speed metal band, you know, like a massive holy war. Let's do that. Okay, cool. How do you spell it, bro? Oh, S-H-I-H-A-D, sweet. just really looked good when it was written down more than anything else. Now it just sort of means the four of us making lots of noise. A friend of ours, Hamish Lang, who joins the first bass player. He's just great, man. I mean, he was really determined and really tight and a really lovely soul, and he played some good shows with us, you know. You know, we turned up as arrogant little shits, kind of denigrating everyone because we were superior, you know. And we'd play, but like the audience kind of went, all oh, right, these kind of like young little kind of urchins can actually deliver. And then I think within about a three month period, we went from kind of opening to headlining. I couldn't believe that they'd played when they were underage to go. I hadn't clicked, you know what I mean? Well, they wouldn't have been able to buy a drink there. <laughs> I mean, the police would come to look for underage, you know, drinkers, and, and the people at the bar would hide us, you know, behind the bar. When the, I remember the police coming and us cowering behind the bar until they left, you know. We were 17, total mummy's boy, m middle class, you know, white boys, and we'd play fast and we played hard and we'd try not to waste time in between songs. I mean, like one night there was a group called the Droogs and they were scary guys, you know, like swastika tattoos and heads. I had one of the main droogs get up and take my mic off me and he was all bandaged up and there was blood seeping through his stomach, through his bandages and he got, he got on the thing and went, if that fucking blah, 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 who stuck me last night turns up, he's fucking dead, you know? And I'm like going, 
<laughs> what am I doing here? You know? We couldn't hear it, you know. Well, we, we heard it, but we could never understand what they were singing about because it was just loud, Very loud music, he heavy stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But we, we still went to all their, all their concerts. concerts. We haven't missed one concert. Whenever they play Wellington, we've yeah, always, always been there. <laughs> You always thought you'd meet girls out of it, but you didn't actually kind of like play the music to meet girls, if you know if, if you know what I mean. We were just all virgins and we practiced, you know? We didn't have girlfriends, <laughs> so we practiced. Push, push, get the pussy. She hard won't go pussy and get 40 people. <laughs> sad, a sad, sad statement on today's rock and roll scene. Gerald turned up, I think, essentially when we started really kind of like selling out venues to the point where we couldn't cope with what, what was going on, and he started offering to help. Yeah, there's a crowd out there already. I can tell you we've had some big problems today. First of all, I said the sound was going to be on at 4 o'clock. Come 4 o'clock, there wasn't a hope of any sound, nothing, no lights. She was getting really worried. I was getting worried. Everyone was worried. There's been a few temper fits today, to be quite honest. Been ugly up here. Phil's had a lot of trouble with his electronic colostomy machine. He hasn't been able to drop one for a couple of days now. The tension short showing on his face. He's our manager. That, that was our manager. I mean, like serious business. And look at him. I thought Gerald was really cool as soon as I met him. I thought he was um, he was very rock and roll because he was playing in Flesh Device, right? And uh, Flesh Device were a classic Wellington punk band. What's that, Gerald? He just seemed like a cool cat and he saw us play, I think, early on and went, I'm manager. He could see five years into the future, he could see ten years into the future. He had old enough to have that kind of sight for us and that was exciting to be around. I mean, the amount of afternoons and evenings I'd spent up there, listening to all this amazing music and checking out all these amazing books of, on art and taking me to see sceptics and thinking, what would happen if... Metal Johnny got exposed to this. You know, I mean, that's a smart move. It made our music blossom. <laughs> Best gig so far. She had on a rocking tour. Things haven't gone too well in Timaru. <laughs> Hundred dollars, mind you. I let someone in at uh, quarter to ten for eight dollars. There's quite a long argument about it, but they finally agreed to pay. It's life, I guess. You know, he used to have great parties at his house, and you know, if, if Gerald was at gigs, Gerald was the one that you wanted to hang hang out with at the gig, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but in, but at the same time, he was, um, you know, he held it all together, obviously. I guess it was 1990 or so. We recorded the Devolve EP. We got our first tours together, the Devolve tour in 91. We had some good shows in the big cities, but then we toured around and we had shows where we had like two people and a guy in a wheelchair and the dog turned up, but that was probably one of the best shows. I think all of us were starting to listen to that sort of more alternative, industrial, heavy stuff. And we were starting to write stuff that was a lot more progressive and, and moving away from the old 80s thrash metal stuff, you know. And, and so it wasn't, it wasn't really Hamish's cup of tea. Um, he wanted to sort of stick with the, the more sort of Metallica 80s thrash stuff. So he left the band after the Devolve tour. Unbeknownst to me, Tom had met this young musician called Carl Kippenberger, who was a fan of Shehard. We always had music mm. playing. I mean, it was a way that Dad used to get me out of bed in the mornings when I was a teenager. I, I just remember being about 11 and hassling Dad about playing Led Zeppelin all the time and going, why do you have to put on all this hippie music all the time? And then it was like a year later, I'm listening to that music. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah we played music all the time. Yeah, all sorts. But yeah. Led Zeppelin. Yeah, well, the big ones, definitely. <laughs> I mean, and the Black Sabbath records were your records too, eh, Mum? Mm. Mum was the metler. <laughs> Before they even termed it. 
I remember when the um, Devolve EP came out, I remember buying it, and I remember ringing up Tom at his home up in Kelvin to say that it was awesome and <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's real. <laughs> hey, Tom, it's Carl here. I just wanted to say that that, that EP's real awesome. And what did he say? You know, he was, I mean, he was, yeah, he was, you know, thank you and all that. I mean, I, I mean even back then as a vague friend, um, me and Tom got on really well, you know. So when Hamish left, it was like this big thing about finding a new bass player. And instantly I remembered Carl. Me and Tom were already jamming together. I think that's sort of where Tom worked out whether I was worthy of auditioning for the, uh, for the Mighty She Heart. <laughs> You know, the first thing that comes up was, well, well, but he's really young and he's still in the kind of the throes of, you know, being into kind of really into the whole Metallica worship thing and we're miles away from that, we're older. I was determined that it w wasn't going to work. So I literally turned up in a total diva mode and <laughs> played with my back to him. <laughs> I was such a prick. So sort of go through about half a dozen songs uh, and he's, you know, He's kind of still got his back to me, and I'm kind of going, oh my God, this is so, so weird. And um, he was amazing. Like, he was amazing. Just after he joined, we got offered to support ACDC. I remember that. We were all jumping up and down with joy. Two nights beforehand, as a rehearsal to get Carl up to speed, we went up to Palmerston North and did a show. That was his first time on stage with us, and it was like 85 people. Okay, tomorrow's going to be 26,000. It was amazing because he would have been 17, 18. It was his 18th birthday, that's right. So it was his 18th birthday, and he's playing with ACD. You know, it's like. There you go. One way to turn 18. <laughs> we moved on from there and worked, started working with Jazz Coleman around the churn era. And Jazz was fantastic. I mean, Jazz was a real producer. Jazz Coleman is the lead singer of um, Killing Joke, who was a band that we absolutely adored. And I think he wanted to produce a New Zealand band. And we were sort of right for him to do. We did the first album, Churn, in six days which is really fast recording, but um, prior to this, I'd taken the guys into um, the basement in West Auckland, which is underneath my house that I was living in at the time, and I rehearsed them up for about three and a half weeks, and we had a lot of fun. We kind of worked on that basis. So it was a kind of open workshop thing. Jazz, uh, he definitely made us, made us... He brought it out of being such a technical art to being more about conjuring up magic. He spends a lot of time talking to us about the power of four. You know, that the, that the power of four people into one energy will always be stronger than four separate entities of power, you know? And I think that's the kind of the lesson that we've learned on the way, is to manifest the greater power. It sounds like heavy dippy shit, but it's actually true, man. It's like, people do great things by themselves, but there's something about groups of humans doing something together. You know, there's chemistry. And things come into focus, you know? Gigs don't usually don't start out fantastic. And it's not until the third or fourth song when magic starts to happen. And the award for most promising group goes to Sheehan. A heavy plank video. Um, well, I don't think we started this band to sort of get to places like this, but hey, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. See ya. Unsolved mysteries of the modern world. The ancient eggs of the greater spotted pity beast. I think Gerald definitely had a big picture. He had a strange big picture, but he definitely had a big picture and made us feel 
have self-belief in the fact that we could actually get outside of New Zealand and take on the world, you know? He made it sound like a reality. And I was fucking all up, up for it. My name is Carl Walterbach and I'm uh, Berlin based. I, uh, my label was named Noise Records and uh, in the 90s I started to look for bands uh, from outside Germany. Thomas my and Agai came across this band from New Zealand and uh, the producer came from Killing Joke, which I had high respect for. Well, I'm Thomas Riesbeck. I work for Noise Records as an A&R manager. Got a demo from Shihat, sent by the manager, famous Gerald D. Wire. He gave us uh, an LP called Churn. I listened to it. I was absolutely blown away by the uniqueness of that band. And uh, yeah, ran out of the office, screaming, we have to sign them, <laughs> we have to sign them, we have to sign them. The band decided to stay for a while in Berlin, I think for six months, and give it a try. Gerald did another band as well, had like a whole. We got them on two of Hiding Dave! <laughs> Gerald Dwyer here. We're at the start of the European tour with Head Like a Hole and She Hard together. This is the first date. We're in Poland right now after successfully crossing the border last night. We're now in a place called Zagreb. No, 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 Katowice. We're part of a large metal mania festival. There's about uh, 20 bands playing today, including Bloodlust, Corruption. Living in Berlin, traveling around Europe, Italy, Spain, France, Germany, England, England. Germany, Scandinavia, it was wicked. Even though at times you didn't sleep and at times you were hungry and you missed your family and you didn't have a shower and you know, your hair turned into dread. What was good about it was so many bands from New Zealand don't get a chance to do because New Zealand's so small, is they don't get a chance to play 150 shows in a year, you know? And that is when a band gets world class. <laughs> Playing night after night, something changed and it's never been taken away from us. There was a drug habit happening in Head Like a Hole with heroin and uh, that was quite accessible in Berlin. Because we were living together, we were like, oh, what, what, is that? what is that shit? Music without drugs is not music. It's like some of the best music you listen to is drug-induced, and uh, <laughs> it's symbiotic. You can't separate it. It just belongs together. Right. As a natural curiosity, um, I mean, I smoked some, you know, and I was like, whoa, that's really bizarre. I knew it was poison straight away, and I knew that I didn't want to get into it, and. Um, that drug's got a weird vibe to it, you know, like it's, there's a darkness to it. And there is a um, karmic thing that means that bad shit happens to you. And bad shit happens to the people around you. And I don't know why that is, but she hard, the band, went, tried it, don't like it, I'm gonna stay away from that shit. Meanwhile, he'd like a whole went, tried it, like it, I want some more of that shit. And things start to become a bit, little bit secretive and, and little clubs form and... I couldn't take Gerald seriously when he was on it and I could tell when he was on it. Just like talking to a ghost. He wasn't there. Gerald was always a dabbler, I think kind of as pretty much everyone <laughs> I knew from that time was in um, various ways. And when I say dabbled, he you know, would use a bit of this and that and possibly like opiates were his drug of choice. I mean, I was quite ignorant to what, exactly what was going on with Gerald and, and drug use. Other members weren't. 
every time we stopped at a gas station, he'd buy a new pair of sun, you know, five dollar sunglasses. It's always the sunglasses, you know, always covering up the eyes. They started off in Wellington, working hard to gain a following. That following got bigger, and now she had a regulars in overseas music magazines. The success of Killjoy in New Zealand has been has been astronomical. I mean, but for most of the album, in fact, the release, you weren't actually in New Zealand. How did it do so well when you weren't even here to promote it? I think people who've seen us live could actually relate to the album a lot easier than they could to churn because Killjoy is like a rock record. That's the thing about New Zealanders. They sort of they tend to like you more when you go away. Little did they know that we're playing in front of five people in the middle of nowhere, but it's over there. So we, when we got back here, Killjoy had taken off. Gerald was when things weren't going right, he was always like, OK, well, what, OK, that's not going right. So what's going right? OK, well, let's just work on that. Keeping everybody moving towards the bigger dream, you know? Coca-Cola Mountain Rock presents to you, Sheehan! It was a music event outside of uh, Woodville up in the Wairapa. It's called Mountain Rock. <laughs> Just through chance, I ran into Gerald and he mentioned what was coming up for Sheha, that mountain rock, and then they were going to do the big day out in New Zealand, and they were doing all of the big day outs in Australia, and it was kind of an important point in their career. And it was like, well, hey, and kind of, and how are you? And it's kind of like, and Gerald said to me then, oh, clean and serene, which is, you know, um, the, uh, the Narcotics Anonymous kind of uh, motto. And I was happy for him, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, that's just, the best news you could have given me. And that particular uh, festival went as wrong as it possibly can. There were counterfeit tickets um, flooding the area. The organisers lost control of the event uh, in terms of security. It was overrun by uh, various feuding gangs. Everything that could go wrong went wrong, and it, because the um, ticket sales went wrong, there was there was no money, and the guys paid Gerald for Sheehard's performance with a worthless check, check bounce. We fucking enjoyed that. See you later. Thank you very much. Sheehard. And then things went really weird. They went on played at the um, seven days later, Saturday Mountain Rock. Friday, big day at New Zealand. Just after the big day out and we were all back at the motel, and, um, you know, everyone was feeling very good. He had, like, a hole had played a spectacular set inside the big tent, and she had played just a brilliant set on the big stage. And some friends of Gerald's had come over from Germany. I came down to New Zealand to see Gerald. I came down to New Zealand to see... Uh, she had do, uh, for the first time, the she had spots on the big day arts, you know. We were waiting at the, at the motel uh, for Joe to pick us up. He never came. Yeah, and uh, I don't know who it was. Somebody came up and said, Joe is dead. He was, you know, very proud of what he achieved and, um, you know, I suppose he just treated himself to, to a hit. I was just hanging in another room, and then Tom just came in and goes, can you do rescue breathing? Gerald's unconscious. 
we actually found him um, just sitting on the bed with his head resting on his hand. I started doing CPR and we were just blowing into his lungs and hearing that it's not really the, the sound that I want to hear, but I don't want to stop and um, just, you know, did my best. But uh, he was already dead, so. What a waste. What a waste. Gerald's tonguey was um, one of the best funerals I've ever been to. Um, it's an amazing way to say goodbye to someone. This, the, the emotional sophistication of how the Maori say goodbye, it's actually the right way to do it. It was my first real experience with uh, losing someone really close, you know? For that interim six month period after Gerald, you know, we just sort of ran on automatic. The last thing we were thinking about was a replacement, so. Poor Tom had to take the role of, you know, like a temporary role of manager. Because there was no one else to do it, you know? And he was, like me, determined that the band was going to survive no matter what tragedy had happened. I remember being uh, extremely aware of how important everyone else who was still alive was to me. And uh, I remember lying there with my partner, Renice, and her daughter, Hanaya, um, my daughter, and just holding on to her and going, yeah, I'm not going to make, make sure that that doesn't happen to you, you know? I don't want anything like that happening to you. We met in a... Um in a mutual crowd, and I was with Anaya's father for a very short period, but that's how I met John initially, and um, we were both 20. I knew her, so I didn't know that well, but I thought she was pretty cute. The father of Anaya, my stepdaughter, my daughter, ended up running a mile when he found out she was pregnant and didn't want anything to do with it, you know? And then we slept together one night, and it was fantastic. And it was like, uh, I am so physically attracted to this woman, it's insane. It was very passionate, and it was very... We disagreed about a lot of things on a fundamental level. But I couldn't keep away from her. I just wrote this melody line. It's almost like ode to the tinnitus in my ears, but it's, it's actually a love song. When you go against the grain, do you know how beautiful you are? When, you've, when there's nothing left to say, you're the brightest star. It's almost tense but beautiful, you know, like, which sort of was like the way I felt a bit about Renee. It's tense but beautiful. Killed her started dealing with um, relationship between Renice and, Renice and I. Like I sort of mentioned before, it's a very passionate sort of relationship, fucking or fighting a lot. Um, and um, so you get songs like You Again, you know, like. <clears throat> slightly crazy girl uh, decided to start telling all our friends that that song was written about her. And um, you should have seen how full on Renee Scott when this woman was saying that song's about me. It was like, actually, bitch, this song's about me. And it was like, at that point I was like, oh my God, because that was like a letter of me going, fuck you to Renee, yet 
she loved the fact that it was about her. You know? She owned that song. Identity definition of She Heart is no doubt centered around the Killjoy album. Like that was really kind of where the band became its own band. The winners are She Heart. She Heart. On top of that, um, the people who bought the records and come to the shows and supported us like that, that's been the, really the most important part. But really, this award is for um, Gerald Dwyer, our manager, who died at the beginning of this year, for all his work, for all his belief. Thanks. Flaming soul. Yeah. We get signed to Warner Brothers in Australia. Part of the deal is we have to move to Australia to live and, you know, dedicate ourselves to this territory because they're funding this record. We all go, yeah, let's do it. All the guys brought their girlfriends over apart from me because I, because the male was in school and, and the grandparents and stuff like that. I had my own thing going on. I had an A and A was number one in my life. So if it ever came down to, and, and it did when the guys eventually moved, if it ever came down to my first responsibility is an heir or being with this person, it, it was an heir. Nobody else had children, so there wasn't ever a group of us that was sort of going through the same thing. We could rely on each other. My parents were, were my support, and she had a great relationship with them, and I just didn't ever conceive of uh, taking that away. I was selfish and very determined that I was going to be in a great band. That came first, and it, it was something that took me away from her, you know, like I spent time with my music like I would with um, a, another lover, in a way, you know? And it became, she started to resent that. Tom came to live here with the band and I had just taken a job at the time, so I said, well, I'm not gonna quit my job unless it's something that's gonna stick. So I gave him six months and then I came over. And I don't, I don't know what it's like to go out with someone who's home every night. <laughs> I'll probably kill them. <laughs> I mean, a band is like a four-way marriage. So you had a four-way mm. marriage living in the one house and then conducting three relationships on top. You know, it just starts yeah. becoming ridiculous. was changing as well like at that time the emphasis was like oh all of a sudden it wasn't about being sonic and heavy it was about how do you write a song you know I was like this is what I want to do now I want to learn how to write a song and because there was no Gerald there to go yeah but bro you're in a high energy wall of sound rock band I didn't give a shit Collapse, disappearing, ascendant. 
little star Do you know what the time is? Is it messing with your mind, kid? And we wrote, and we wrote, and we wrote, and we wrote Every night, wrote, 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 wrote by that stage, we had the riff for General Electric. My Monster Today was in, you know, kind of like a loose punk rock form. And then it was like, I can't remember how we got in touch with Garth. My name is Garth, and uh, I'm a record uh, producer. I have done Alice Cooper, I've done Kiss, I've done Trapped, uh, the first Rage against the Machine record. I did She Had, which is up there too, if you want to point that. Actually, flee from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He named me Yagagagarthatron because I can't talk. <laughs> I stutter. We upended to Canada for three months to record the album. And really, what it was is the band got focused and the band chose the right producer. Every band has to tell me when I first meet them, I ask them a very simple question. I go, Who are you? And what are, what are you trying to, to tell this world? And, and it's amazing how many times bands just don't have a clue how to, how, yeah, you know, you know, they do not know how to answer that question. What she had? She had really, really kind of knew who they were. Um, they just didn't understand the actual level of what I was going to actually bring them up to. They didn't understand the actual dedication, the, the hard work. And it was more or less to make every song sound different and um, um, how everything had to have its part in its place. Everybody in this field, jump, jump, break, jump! General Electric really kind of like kicked the door down and it was our first album where we had different countries reacting to the same album in the same way. In the continuing saga of Australia nicking our best talent, they put Shehard up for three arias, unfortunately getting beaten out by Killing Heidi. Our band started to get pretty popular in Australia and it's all setting up real, real nice, like really, really good. It's the point where things can actually tip over to really big and you know, the people around you start seeing platinum records and the, and, and the holiday house and you know all that kind of stuff and so their projection onto you and what you're doing creatively becomes much more focused and desperate. By the end of the General Electric period, um, Phil's relationship was falling apart at the seams because of his alcoholism was really starting to crystallise. <laughs> I mean, I was very shy. I was very shy as a kid. Um, I guess I figured out that um, if I was drunk enough, I could um, help to bring me out of my shell and be a bit more of a performer on stage and a bit more of a rock star, you know? <laughs> I had to, had to be drunk. And that was, that was a prerequisite for, for me being on stage, you know? Okay. You hungry? We haven't been paid yet. When I first met Phil, um, first saw him play, he had his back to the crowd <laughs> the whole time. 
he found his passion, but it was a passion for a job which was the antithesis of what his natural inclination would want him to do. <laughs> At that point, I just never figured out how to do it um, sober. I never tried, and, um, and then I just came convinced that I couldn't do it without, I couldn't get on stage and, um, without being drunk, you know? I was sort of like, well, he's playing this thing, but I didn't really think about it that much. It was actually Tom that actually went, oh, dude, you're actually out of control. I was the one who really first started trying to pull up the red flag and say, look, this is going beyond a normal kind of, like, fun, drunken episode where you fuck up a bit and got a bit rowdy. And this is also happening every day, and this has also become such a crutch. When he started truly fucking up the gigs was when it started pissing me off. For us, even though it was unspoken, it was really, we're all different people, do whatever we do to make ourselves happy. Don't fuck with the band, you know? It's sacred ground. And there was one big day out in Auckland uh, where, I don't know, I was extra nervous beforehand or something, and uh, I was drunk by the time we got on stage and they, you know, kept on drinking. While we on, I was stopping playing during a song to continue drinking. That was the last straw. And the other three guys came to my hotel room and said, you know, you've really let us down. If you continue to drink before or during a performance, we're gonna look at getting another guitarist, you know? So that's where the drinking and playing stopped. I mean, I, kept, I continued to drink after the show and everything. But at that time, you have me and, you know, I'm a mess. My relationship's kind of gone to one side, but I'm really focused on, you know, kind of the next stage of the band. You know, my personal life's in a total, in, in a disaster land. Tom once waltzed off with someone else, and I think Sarah was um, yeah. um, uh, momentarily, at least, um, captivated by someone else during all that time. Yeah. And maybe that was the year that, that those things happened. Well, it was really just about reappraising how my life was working, you know, and, and, and from top to bottom, because I wasn't particularly happy with how, you know, I was feeling or what was happening to me personally. In, in, in the dumbest possible terms, I'd had to, I had to find myself, and I needed to reassess some stuff and. That's what happened, and I didn't handle it very well, and I, I didn't behave very well. It makes me sad and sorry to think about those times again, but I do also think that that was a big part of why we're here now, and I think it's our quiet kind of strength and bond together, really, you know? Mm. So that's kind of it. <laughs> you probably still hate me, though, don't you? <laughs> I, I would say that you lost the plot in every area. <laughs> I partied pretty hard at that point. You start getting given shit all the time, free drinks, free drinks. And I went, cool, bring it on. We had a lot of pressure on us. And I think John started folding. There was a weight of expectation that I'd never experienced before. It was like, oh, now we have to make a record that's better than the last record. And I started developing massive anxiety attacks. Also, I was living in Melbourne apart from Renice and Amaya, and I was really, really lonely. And to deal with that loneliness and all that expectation and shit, I was just hammering myself. I started developing like this absolute phobia of music. It would give me an anxiety attack, you know? I couldn't listen to my favorite albums anymore, and it just reminded me of the music industry and all the other stuff around the music industry, which I was starting to find out about more, didn't really want to be associated with. Any time I was around music for a little while there, I was, my whole body was, you know, just being flooded with adrenaline. It made me want to run for the hills. And that's what I did. In 2001, he, he had a breakdown, yes, and came back. And that was just the pressure? I think yeah. so, yeah, yeah. I remember one day I had to go to work in the morning 
and he didn't want to be in the house by himself. So his dad came over and I went to work and I came back and he hadn't even gotten out of bed and his dad was sitting on a chair in our room and they were watching TV. But John was just like very uncomfortably sitting bolt upright um, until I'd gotten home. He, he wasn't with you, you know what I mean? Um, and he, he didn't know where, to, where he was going or where he was heading, you know. It was a bad time for him because he was so in such a depressed state at that time and uh, just, you know, he's never been like that before and so he didn't know what was going to happen. So we just supported him and tried to tell him he's still as good as he used to be. Yeah. We were, we were lost. And at the same time, we had record companies from America going, hey, that shit deal with noise is coming up, you know, it's almost finished, and, you know, that General Electric record's really good, you know? What do you reckon? Come over. The American thing had stayed for so long as this kind of light that you could never reach because of all these barriers and all these obstacles. But the journey to arrive there exhausted us in many ways. So, internally, we're a mess. But of course, we have this fervent belief that if we get the chance in the United States, we can turn it around and make it actually work for ourselves. It was always our dream, it was always our fantasy, you know, to tour the States. So many of our, you know, idols and bands that we were into had come from there. And, and, uh, and finally, after all this time and all this work, um, we had a real opportunity to go and work there. My name is Angus Vale and I came to the States in 93 and my cousin actually gave me the She Had Blue album which I thought it was one of the most uh, amazing records that I'd heard for the, like the last five years. So I called Tom out of the blue and said, oh hi, I'm Angus Vale, I'm a Kiwi, um, working with Kiss in America and he was like, yeah right. <laughs> and I was like, look, I think this record's brilliant and uh, you know, whatever I can do with you guys coming to America, um, I'd love to help or whatever. My name's Doc McGee, I own McGee Entertainment. We've managed everybody from James Brown, Isaac Hayes, Diana Ross, Guns N' Roses, and Kiss. We're handicappers. We, we, we go to the racetrack every day, and we look at the horses, and then we look at how they look, how they're, how they're running, we look at their times, we look at who's riding them, we look at what barn they're out of, all that kind of stuff to determine if we want to bet on that horse, okay? And she had, we were going to bet on. They had everything that was on my checklist. We actually went after them pretty good. You know, we didn't, we didn't get a chance to work with them. I, I saw them play um, to a bunch of cynical, burned-out A&R artists and repertoire, you know, the guys that sign bands to record labels and they played a showcase at a small club called Brownies in New York. It was one of those shows where, you know, was, the club was like this, the band were playing, and because everybody's, you know, New York crowd, you know, old and bitter, whatever, they were all standing back and John jumped off the stage and basically brought the band to them and got in their faces and people were just blown away by them. Josh, who we'd worked with previously when we first went to LA, came along to the New York showcase and absolutely loved the show and uh, put the offer towards us that he, he could produce our record and hook us up with the firm, which was a massive management company that did actors and musicians and all sorts. And so we took him up on it. We have a producer who has made the band their pet project and was putting basically all their resources into it. And we have a scenario which is essentially everything we've ever wished for and worked for. It's pretty much in terms of the possibilities as close to perfect as you can have. Josh, get Josh on camera. <laughs> oh, Josh Abrahams. Now listen, he was born here, he's dealt with all these people that have become famous and have got their music out to lots of people and I thought, well, he knows better than anybody. He knows better than me, he knows better than the rest of the band. 
it all seemed like the the stars were finally aligning, you know, that, that things were finally falling into place. At this point, when we arrive in LA, I'm still on Valium to stop me having anxiety attacks. So I wasn't totally well in the head, you know? We turned up in LA and jo John had been working with Josh Abrahams, he was already there. And John picked us up from the airport. O on the drive from the airport, he starts playing us all these shared songs. And you're going, who's that playing bass? Oh, it's this awesome bass player that Josh got in. All right, and who's, who's playing guitar? Oh, it's this guy that came in and yeah, see, it's, it, I mean, even though it's not you guys, it still really sounds like us. Who's that playing drums? Oh, it's Josh Fries. You know, it's, it sounds like Josh Fries. It's amazing. And then, it, but it was then it was like, but it doesn't sound like us, and it doesn't sound like Tom. And I could see Tom there, kind of going, "What the fuck's been going?" You know, it was kind of like there's this kind of three band members sitting in the back of a car, going, "Right, so this is to the point where the whole band's being replaced right now, and you're letting that happen, too good." Mm -hmm. Our ethic was that we're a, a band of four, we share everything together, we split everything even, and as time went on you sort of realised that there was this division happening between the band and Johnny. Fire! I was singled out by Josh as obviously the guy that was driving the ship, uh, the singer, and he was trying to do his best to groom me for what he thought was the would be successful over there. In the making of the Pacifier album, it's like a dictionary definition of self-sabotage in a lot of ways. When your hair is all puffed up like that, it, it looks, looks fucking good. awesome, dude. Where you see a clown, everyone sees a rock star. Well, sure, I see a rock star, but I'm just talking fucking everyday life. Seriously, you look amazing. Here's the time. Please, listen to me. Hear me out. It is purely about how uncomfortable I feel with a great big fucking hairdo. You know, thing okay? is, it's at that point that if you have a strong collective character and a strong internal character, that those decisions start making themselves well. But of course, at that point, our internal scripts were fucked. Can you please turn it off to me? There was quite a, I just felt a global sense of despair or something, you know, there was a real, there was a real weird feeling. Then, I mean, all of a sudden the, the whole world's blooming, freaking out. I mean, obviously, with the Americans that we were working with, you know, life stopped for them. And meanwhile, us three are in a rehearsal space with Josh, who hasn't quite worked out what the implications of what has just happened. And it becomes sort of apparent to us. We're called she -heart, you know? Like, uh, this is maybe not such a good thing. Someone had thought that, you know, um, maybe the name's gonna be a problem. I guess that's where the, the thinking about the name change started, I guess. The name has too many terrorist associations in America. Lisa Glass explains. The problem is that shihad's uncomfortably close to jihad, a term for holy war which conjures up too many disturbing images for the sensitive American market. I think they would have a tough time getting on the scene with a name like that, wh whether it be being booked in uh, mainstream rock clubs or trying to get radio airplay. All of a sudden, we had this identity and not really the identity that we wanted. And then it became an internal struggle. I can tell you right now, honestly, I was one of the fucking hardcore ones that went no fucking way. But like, Phil and Tom are starting to go, if we don't change our name, all those dreams are gone. So we watched this wave of nationalism happen and it didn't come down. It got worse and worse and worse. 
and the name became dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. So in the end, I had to concede we were looking at two options. We don't change our name and we give up that dream of being in America, or we change our name and give it a go. Do you go with shit A or do you go with shit B? Seriously, that was my options. Shit A or shit B. I've never done America before. Fuck it, let's do it. Let's change. And after six, seven weeks of, you know, I'd usually say discussions, but they were arguments, we finally changed the name. They've changed their name to Pacifier because Shihad sounded too much like Jihad, which is Arabic for a holy war. That's all bullshit to me. You know what I mean? You can name the bands the Dead Kennedys. You can name them, you know what I mean? There, there's, so I think when you start changing people, this is how things fall apart. Shahad. Shahad. Shihad. Shihad. It almost looks Middle Eastern. It makes me think of some sort of indie band maybe yeah. upcoming. The piece of wisdom that we needed at that time that we have now is that these things blow over. Pacifier, that sounds like, uh, that doesn't sound that good. Pacifier makes me think of babies. Pacifier. <laughs> maybe like a mellow band, so like something mellow and kind of groovy. Horrifying. Yeah. Pacifier, Jesus, no. <laughs> and then we announced our first show as Pacifier at the Viper Room. The management label go, right, it is now time to sell our investment onto a record company. And they invite every single major label in the country. A couple of days before we do these shows, they start bringing these record company guys in individually to have a listen to the record. There's a lot of excitement, you know? And this bidding was starting to happen. And at that point, the offers that were kind of flying around were up on the four million mark. <laughs> That week preceding that, we had a bunch of rehearsals in a room the size of a hangar. <laughs> you know, it was just huge. What was happening through that week, I just noticed how much the label were getting involved. You got fucking fat grooves, you got big beats, you got big grooves, you got a lot of rock, you got a ton of energy, and then I'm just wondering if it doesn't come down too much. So I'm just we're rehearsing, you know, but honestly, we barely ever rehearse, and there's a new member of the management company coming in and advising us to change the set every day. Yeah. Absolutely. This track here that we just played so, is pretty good. It's not going to think that the live room is going to be fabulous. Dude, people will be doing the that. The head of the management company is going to come in and he's going to have a listen. He gives his opinion, but then Josh Abrahams will come back in and he goes, oh, no, I disagree with that. This is my project. I want you to do this. And then, you know, this is this kind of like 15 cooks in the kitchen. Number two is General Electric, right? What's it? What's it? Then all of a sudden, they're deciding what our set list is. You know, we've got 30 minutes set or something. We're right in the middle. They want us to leave the stage, Johnny to do the big, you know, sort of acoustic hit that they think is going to be really big and it's going to really draw them in. It gets a little lonely on the road. <laughs> <laughs> After this, what are you guys doing? I love it. Want to go to a bar? <laughs> and more and more, Josh Abrahams is pushing the band into the background and pulling John into the foreground, and you know, taking John out at nights and leaving us to go and do our thing while John get par gets paraded around Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, he was just getting stuff puffed up his ass, and he was totally buying it. I think that's what was more happening. How does that transition from bulletproof to walls, walls to stranger feel? Probably good, but it's all reliant. Um, you know what? It's his what? communication with the guitar tip. And if that's wobbly, it'll be shifty. Really? Wow. As you... I mean, basically, <laughs> it's true, you know. What's that? The guitar tip's got to be bang there as soon as the last note. You mean so there's no downtime? Yeah. We arrive at the show, and we've got this Frankenstein set We've been rehearsing for the show all week, but we have barely had time to rehearse because every day there's a photographer coming in or a stylist coming in or someone who's going to take you around and introduce you to Hollywood celebs and all this kind of crazy stuff that just starts ramping up towards the show. Place packed. No punters. It's all record companies. Island Def Jam, Sony, Warner Brothers, you know, all of them. They're all sitting there 
and they're all like, cool, this is gonna be good, it's gonna be good. Yeah. So we, we get on, we play three songs from, from Pacifier. We walk off the stage, Johnny grabs the guitar, he goes, it's out of tune, gave it down to the guitar tech, tech gets it to his thing, and then all of a sudden, Johnny's there on stage, on his own, without an instrument or a band to hide behind, and he starts feeling uncomfortable. And obviously knowing him very well, Tom and I started feeling uncomfortable for him. So standing on stage, it's dead air time, and he just goes, anyone heard any good jokes recently? And, you know, a couple of people, you know, murmur, a couple of heckles, you know, then he goes, I've got one. And the joke was, what is the only animal with a cunt halfway up its back? The answer being a police horse. As soon as I heard him say that, I just went, oh, because you, you, you can't say cunt in America, because they just take it so seriously, you know. And the other thing is that with everything that had happened around 9-11, talking shit about the police force in any way was really off the table socially, and particularly in front of a bunch of labels who flown in from New York. And so what I watched was I watched the head of MCA, who was kind of just off to my left, just basically tap his second in charge and just go, we're out. And I started watching a stream of people flow out the you know stage door right beside me. I just watched them, the crowd just start to evaporate. I just remember looking at Tom when he did the punchline of the joke, Tom looking at me, he had a towel and we just pulled Tom's towel over our heads and we hid under the towels for about a minute. <laughs> and I really didn't want to go back up on stage after that. After the Viper Room, label Arista decides to pick us up based on the strength of that album. Luckily, no one from Arista was actually at that show. So they signed us up and set up a tour for us. So we got an, a, a new breath of life. My name's Ro Gallo. I was uh, the day-to-day -day manager for Pacifier when they were in the US. Uh, they had two management companies that took care of them. Uh, I worked for Indigoot, which is uh, in New York. And when you come to America, it's massive. You know, these guys are, th you know, throwing money at you. You know, they've got these $400,000 budgets for video. You know, you turn up to a video and you've got two stylists, and it's, it's a lot more pressure. There was just money being thrown around, I feel, for the wrong reasons. Ridiculous budgets for a band that nobody knew just didn't make sense. Every time you regularly will take you out for dinners and lunches and all that kind of stuff, you're you're paying for that. The bands, all of a sudden one day they go, well, what happened to all our money? Well, you're you, you know regularly will took you out for dinner and they bought and, and they bought you lobster and steak and you had the best ball of wine. Well, you know what? You got to pay for that. You're paying eighty cents on the dollar for that loan. For for every dollar that you, that you borrow. It cost you a dollar eighty to pay it back. The plan was to get them out on tour, just keep them touring. That's the only way people in the States are going to see them. Oh, it was an amazing experience. I mean, it was like, you know, four months touring around the States, you know? It was like the ultimate, the ultimate American road trip, you know? I mean, it was a great cultural experience, you know? Ciao! You only Thank live you. once, play hard. But whatever you do, don't go home hard. <laughs> We're out of here. See ya. You better stop or you run right into me. <laughs> Where are we at the moment, Milo? Past Lord Minister, about 35 miles. You know, they had a brand new, huge Prevo bus. When I saw it outside the club in New York, I was like, damn, for a band that's starting off, OK, this is probably a bit too much. My bands, they, they play pay toilets and use their own change, OK? That's the only way you learn, OK? You don't come in here and get them to the tour bus, let them go. They eat my bands, no, never happened. The number of phone calls or the number of messages where it's like, yeah, we're going to be home in a month. Oh, no, now we're staying for another two months. I mean, I never knew when John was coming home next. 
And more often than not, I never knew how long he was going to be home for. And if I did know how long he was going to be home for, it could change, just like that. There was definitely a lot of personal strife that I got from Renice while I'd be travelling, which I would have to lay on the guys, you know, because she meant a lot to me. You turn up for a tour of the United States and it's the, it's the one that you've fought all your life for. And I remember John calling a meeting and saying... I might lose my relationship if I don't go back, you know, if I don't go and see this person, you know, which would be a nightmare for those guys, but it was a nightmare for me, the whole fucking thing, you know. And it's like, there's that tour that's like taking 15 years to get to that point. If you've ever, you know, kind of known what it's like to run into battle behind a general who all of a sudden starts running back the other way, that's what it was like. I was speechless, you know? I think we actually couldn't fathom the audacity of it. Or well, just, you know, the, the lack of comprehension, I think, on John's part of what he was kind of asking of us to tolerate. <laughs> Because the tour we were on sucked dick. We were playing to nobody. It was a tour from hell. And it slowly got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. I hated it. Essentially, you know, the radio thing didn't work in the United States. I think by the end of it, we had effectively in the US failed on that record. The problem is, is that record companies, they throw stuff out there, and if it doesn't ignite straight away, they're like, oh, on to the next one. They're not about the... I mean, about the artistic merit of it, it's bollocks. In America, they're about the profit motive. They have to answer to their shareholders. M music here is a commodity. As they were on tour, things started falling apart. The music wasn't really hitting. Things just weren't going, I guess, fast enough for certain people. I was in the office, and my boss just comes over and says, they're pulling the plug on this project. We have to send the band home. Uh, I'd stopped drinking for four months during most of that American tour, and I remember um, going to the bottle store and, and getting um, getting a six pack of Budweiser and uh, drinking that after hearing the, getting the call from Rogue. I mean, I, I did find it a little interesting how easy it was for Johnny to go turn around and go, "Let these fuck off." Because in the end, it was like, we've been fighting so hard, it seemed so weird to just, you know? It did feel like it was the end of America when we left, you know? I was so happy, you know? I can't express how happy I was. Uh, we were on this tour to nowhere, and I miss my girlfriend and I miss my daughter. There was a lot of soul searching that needed to happen and the logical thing to do after, after all of that was to get back home and be with my family and sort of wash all that shit out of my brain, you know, and start feeling human again. Because I do remember that plane ride home seriously thinking about what else I could do. And if you're wondering what I thought I could do, um, I was thinking I could be a chef. I definitely felt, you know, we had our tail in between our legs coming back from there, you know. We copped a lot of flack on the radio stations over here in Australia. And I guess we couldn't have predicted the extent of the backlash, you know. Oh, I've just come back to New Zealand and I'm getting called a sellout motherfucker in my hometown when I walked down the street. So I became quite angry and resentful. One, two, yeah. I wasn't proud of myself, you know. And I'd always been proud of being in this band. It was a source of my pride, you know, was being in Shehaj, you know. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Who are you guys here to see? Um, I'm from Pacifier. Oh. Have you heard of us? Yeah. yeah. Oh, phew. <laughs> Changing your name is the biggest compromise you can make. And 
Once you've done that, you can't undo it. You can go back to your original name, but we will forever be known as the band that changed our name. There's, there's no, no better sound to me than hearing a crowd chant, she hard, she hard, she hard. Yeah. Well, we found that out, especially when we especially changed to Pacifier. Yeah, totally. And the She Hard chant became louder than it ever had. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I remember the, the first few times I heard the She Hard, She Hard chant, I was like, who's Hard She? <laughs> hard She, Hard She, Hard She. We were bigger than we were on the General Electric, but I was so angry about the whole affair, I didn't even care, you know, I just didn't care. I was not sure about that band that I was in, you know? because of the compromises we made. That was the thing right from the word go. I want to be in a shit-kicking band. Because I'd always been in one, whether people liked us or hated us. I was in that band, until Pacifier. So we looked at each other and went, do we still want to do this? Do we still want to do this? <sighs> yeah, I think we still want to do this. But man, it's got to be on our terms. Those last two years hurt too much, you know? And we um, sussed out a place, just mountainous and dramatic, desolate New Zealand landscape. The complete opposite of everything that happened to us and everything that the band used to be to me. <laughs> really, we were trying to find a way to fall in love with, with making music again take the pressures away and do it for ourselves. The premise was, if this is our last chance to record a record, then this is the record that we would come out with. So that's pretty much what Lovers in New Hay was. Every night we were just making this raucous, some of the heaviest, you know, most frantic music that we'd made for years, you know? And yeah, I mean, we just wanted to create a bonfire of music in, in which to burn the remnants of the pacifier experience. Writing these songs, constantly going, that's pretty she hardy, that one. You know, that's, yeah, we should do that she hard riff with the blood. And all of a sudden, we're relating the feel of some of these songs to the band she hard. <laughs> So we got in touch with Garth Richardson again. He was more than happy to do another record with us. So we jumped on a plane. And on the same day that we jumped on a plane to go to Vancouver, we also decided that we were going to change our name back to She Hard. Pass five over. And as you say that, you're actually putting your website up for those core people that go straight to it. Your fans go, what the fuck's going on? And then they see She Hard. So they get it first, as was the band wish. Here's a song for everybody who has stuck through it with us through fucking thick and thin, man. This song's called Home Again. and fans that have been biting their tongue for the last, you know, two years. And they could finally say, thank God, that was such a stupid idea to change your name to Pacifier. Thank God you've changed it back to She Heard. With your love, I can feel more than anything. With your with your love, I can see more than anything. Um, 
with your love I can feel more than anyone you know like and it's like so it's like it's pretty full on and I meant those words when I said it you know and it's like that was what was so heartbreaking about the whole thing it was like man I love this woman but we've got such separate ways of looking at the world you know and then when we got married and we actually made a promise to each other that we would never spend that amount of time that far apart again. <laughs> and literally within like two days of talking about that and kind of making that promise to each other, they decided they were going to do Love is the New Hate with Garth and they were going to do it in Canada, and that, which means they were going to be gone for like four months. Uh -huh. singers have to come from a place of emotional honesty and that was John's place of emotional honesty for a long time. It was like that's the thing he could feel and relate to and made him passionate and he was able to express himself about that which actually yeah. made it affecting. I don't have a problem with any of it being focused on him so much because no. I actually think that the results of that gave us some great music and you know was honest. Well we got, we got some great songs out of it. <laughs> The good thing about doing the stuff in New Zealand is that you don't really have to worry about the big spiders. Uh, I've always thought about moving back to New Zealand ever since I first moved to Melbourne. I think in 99 when we moved over, it was a commitment that we had to make with the record company. But I enjoy living in Melbourne, so life's kind of life's good. That whole period in the States, was a strain on Jen and I's relationship. I mean, we were probably quite lucky to still have something out of that, really. He warned me that going out with him was, would be quite difficult. There can be large periods of time where you're not with him. Um, um, it's weird, and it, it is quite difficult. But um, there's a lot of love between Carl and I, and I think that'll go on forever, you know what I mean? This is the Spanish Quarter of Melbourne, you know? Um, I still have yet to find the Spanish Quarter of Wellington. While I was in America, I fell in love with Mexican and South American and, and Caribbean flavours that were available. La Marina. Last year, when we were thinking about it being the end of the band, it ended up being a new, a new lease of life. I mean, you know, touring, touring with ACDC, you know, the band that we supported when I was still at high school. Um, and that was, that was a full circle in itself. Since I was 15, I've spent most of my life with, uh, with these three guys, and I've spent more time with them than I have any, anyone in my family. They are like brothers to me, and we've been through so much together, you know? It's a slow, long process. I mean, I just finally surrendered to the fact that I couldn't drink like normal people, you know? So eventually I had to stop drinking altogether and stay stocked. Once you make that decision, there's support out there, similar to Yogadaholics Anonymous. They're a worst addiction they have, I think. I'm pretty obsessive, you know, when I find something I like, you know? I just want all of it. Well, this, I mean, this light and creamy stuff's not bad. Snuffy, look over there. Oh, put your hand in front of your chest. I met Caroline a year and a half after my last drink. I don't think she would have been interested in meeting the old Phil, you know. Richard! At this point, you know, I like what I do. I like every day because I'm driven by doing stuff I love, you know what I mean? And I'm coming home and seeing Sarah and seeing Sam, two gorgeous girls, and the sight of people's faces make you happy, you know? You come home to your family and it really just has all of a sudden clicked into, oh, I have a family now, you know, and it's awesome. If I don't see Sam in the day, I feel like I've starved, you know? I really do, I feel like there's something wrong, like I haven't drunk enough water, <laughs> you know what I mean? I suppose it, life is kind of deeper and richer and, and, and a little bit slower. 
but it's still work on music every day that's what I, that was always the goal like play music or I'm with musicians and helping them or you know recording stuff or any of that kind of thing I'm completely obsessed and involved in music and that was always what I what I've needed to do because that's who I am and you know Sarah's been that person who supported me with it throughout any relationship especially a long-term one you do fall out of love and then you come around and you fall back in love and you know all the daily things come crowding in and you get sidetracked from your basic feelings for, for each other and problems are sometimes bigger than they really are and all of that kind of stuff but I could always bring myself back to that falling in love all over again thing um, until the last couple of years of our relationship, I just couldn't. Well, we must have dealt with it pretty well because we stayed together for 18 years. We dealt with it by just being madly passionate and having long periods of loneliness and sorrow and, and then periods of joy and refound love and then reality sets in and I'm sure there's moments where she couldn't wait till I went away again. And there was moments when I couldn't wait up till I was gone again, you know? And in the end, it stopped working. In the end, it became, as we matured and mellowed a little bit, it became a real hindrance to having a real relationship. Towards the end of, of our marriage, it always felt like we were living it like this. You know, he was here, I was there, and we were in parallel. And we were, you know, kind of travelling the road together. Um, but eventually he went off that way and I went off that way. And I was happy to go off that way and he was happy to go off that way. I'm a classic lead singer, you know. I mean, I do understand that I can, it's all about me and how painful that is to be around. And I also realise how it's not all about me. You know, I am smart enough to know that. I totally understand why they'd get fucked off with me. best and we've seen each other at our worst you know we've seen so much of the world together and it's that family thing you know I would we sort of learn to love people warts and all you walk in you get those four people in a room together and you're going to get that band and together we equal what she had is and it is there is a circle completed in terms of you know now it feels like that's a band that's a band and that's what it should be I'm one quarter of four, you know, of, of this whole thing. And we're all in this, you know? We're all doing this together, you know? If we have a bad tour, we all take the hit evenly. If we have a good tour, we all are awarded evenly. I mean, we'll always have this history together. And I think that it, it'll always be part of our lives, you know? I mean, how could it not be after 22 years? We're lucky enough to have had such a long career and, uh, you know, the band doesn't just exist amongst the four of us, it exists, you know, in other people's lives as well, you know. Everybody, put your hands up in the air so I can see them, please. Everybody. And you're up there. Now wave them like this, come on. The song is called Passion Fire. Beautiful. You feel it good to me, cause I got so that 
fucking rule. But don't look so wretched up. There ain't no power in. It's not supposed to happen flow. Stop. You are the best at what you are, but do you?